April 14, 1912, was a Sunday. In fact, it was the uh, Sunday after Easter, better known in those years as Low Sunday or Wit Sunday, or sometimes known as Quasi Modo Sunday, which was the uh, first phrase in Latin at the Mass at the time. Now known today as Divine Mercy Sunday. It was also happened to be the infamous day that the RMS Titanic, the infamous doomed ship, struck an iceberg in the North Atlantic and would sink in the early hour of the morning of the morning of April 15, 1912. On board that doomed ship was uh, were a couple of priests, but among those was Father Thomas of Violence, who was from Essex, England. He happened to be on the ship only because his brother was being married and he was going to be celebrating his brother's wedding in New York and the idea was to come back the following week. But Divine Providence had other plans for Father Providence. As if he, he was praying his divine office, Psalm, on the deck of the ship, when the ship hit the iceberg, and it said, in fact, that ice flew off and almost hit him as he was walking on the decks. But when it became clear that the ship was actually sinking, uh, Father Violet was going through the uh, cabins, the calls. In fact, he was the one who got the gates open for the third class Irish passengers uh, so that some of them at least uh, were able to be saved. Otherwise, they would have, all the third class passengers would have gone down with the Titanic. But it was Father Biles who got them unlocked in some of those stairwells. And people were coming up to Father Biles and they were desperate and they were praying and he was giving them consolation. He was blessing people, even baptizing people uh, that were coming to him. Everybody, Catholics, non-Catholics, uh, Jewish people, different people on the ship. They knew their power was there and he was a shepherd. He wasn't their shepherd. He was unknown to them. But the survivors of the sinking remembered being on the lifeboats and the last image of Father Bile was being up on the deck of the ship with literally, they said, hundreds of people who were gathered around him and he was leading them in the ropes. He was twice offered a place on the lifeboat. You know, the old saying was women and children first, but because of his status as a Catholic priest, he was twice offered a chance to get off of it. And he refused, gave the place to someone else. And he stayed there with this little flock that they didn't even know of, to offer them the greatest consolation and the ultimate moment of life. Jesus in today's gospel says that he is the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep that the prophets of the Old Testament had told was coming. He is the shepherd prince, the new David, who frees people from the bondage of sin, gathers them into one flock, the church, under the, a new covenant made by his blood. His flock includes other sheep, he says, Far more than the dispersed children of Israel, he gave his church the mission of shepherding all people to the Father. In the first reading for this morning's Mass, we see the beginning of that mission in the testimony of Peter, whom the Lord appointed shepherd of his church. Through the ministry of the church, the shepherds still speak, and they forgive sin, make his body and blood present, that all might make a no him in the breaking of the bread. It's a mission that will continue until all the world is one flock under one shepherd. Laying down his life and taking that up again, Jesus made it possible for us to know God as he did it. As sons and daughters, as we just heard, the Father who loves us. As we hear in today's Epistle reading, he calls us his children, as he called Israel his son, when he led them out of Egypt and made his covenant with them. 
God did not cause the Titanic to sink, but that terrible tragedy did involve, as we know, a great deal of human miscalculation, hubris, and pride. St. Thomas Aquinas famously said that pride is the worst of all the sins. It's the first of what we call the seven deadly sins or the cardinal sins. They are so called because the word cardo in Latin means hint, like on a door. St. Thomas observed that when we morally consent to any of the seven deadly sins, it just opens the, the door to all the rest of them. That's why he said it's the worst, because it's the first. St. Thomas defined pride as an excessive desire for one's own excellence, which rejects subjection to God. And the famous Baltimore Catechism defined it as an excessive love of our own ability so that we would rather sinfully disobey than humble ourselves. Sometimes people think that pride is, you know, this like thought that I'm better than somebody else. I'm, I'm a privilege, I'm, they're less than me. That's not actually pride. Pride in its purest diabolical form is, is a rejection, as St. Thomas said, a subjection to God. But there are four evil fruits of pride. And this is among those. Sinful ambition, vain glory, presumption, and hypocrisy. Fortunately, we don't see any of those in the culture around us today. <laughs> uh, the effects of pride are twofold, called concupiscence. It is, St. Thomas described, a darkened intellect and a weakened will. We don't see things as they really are. We see them the way we want to see them. And we have a tendency to do and say hurtful, sinful things. That's a weakness in us that, re that re remains even after our baptism. And so we have to be cautious of that because those effects will stay with us to the end. There's a famous story of a very successful businessman and he comes to the end of his career, he retires, he shows up for his first day in assisted living. They're giving him a tour of the facility. He sees two beautiful women sitting out on the porch. He approaches them, he adjusts his French couplings and he looks at them and says, ladies, do you know who I am. They look at me and they say, well, no. But if you go inside and ask the nurse, <laughs> she can tell. <laughs> St. Padre Pio, perhaps the greatest modern saint of our Catholic order, famously said in life, we are either moving toward God or away from me. But you and I live in a time when many, if not most, of our contemporaries are under the illusion that there's a third option now, neutral. That somehow after all these centuries of human experience on this earth, poor earth, I can personally live outside the little box of the Bible, or more and more today, the natural law in some kind of secular utopia, which is an interesting word in Greek. It means nowhere. It's a mirage. It doesn't exist. There is literally no way of being neutral to the spiritual battle of any age. You're either engaged or you're not. And if you're not, you're gonna get run over by the consequence. You can say, I don't care. That stop sign, that red light, that's not my truth. It doesn't apply to me. I will just ignore those until one day, until yourself or someone else or both. You can't live outside of the consequences of violating the divine and natural law. And we live in a culture that is clearly declining with this illusion as it moves not just away from the Bible, natural law, but certainly the practice of religion. Archbishop Sheen said it this way, the more people give up on God, the more they give up on one another. We hear it this way in the culture, I'm spiritual, but not religious. Which is an interesting phrase often used these days 
and I don't, with all due respect to the people who use it, that is a perfect description of the death of it. He's an angel, he's fallen, corrupted, 100% spiritual, hates religion, corrupted religion, false religion, twisted. There are such things. There are portions who worship the devil himself. Corrupted religions twisted. They kill people. The devil loves those. But the devil, the prince of darkness, the prince of hell, is the definition of being spiritual but not religious. And we see the corresponding effects in us. Growing, growing deeper and deeper divisions, hatred, violence, and now war again in this world on a scale that is almost incomprehensible. And because people have largely given up on the practice of religion, they are making a religion out of what St. Augustine famously called in the fourth century, the libido dominandi, money, power, and of course, sex. Archbishop Cheney said this, America, it is said, is suffering from intolerance. It is not. It is suffering from tolerance. Tolerance of right and wrong, truth and error, virtue and evil, Christ and chaos. Our country is not nearly so overrun with the bigoted as it is overrun with the broad-minded, end quote. William Penn, the great founder of the Commonwealth that I live in over in Pittsburgh, Famously said in the year 1668, men must be governed by God or they will be ruled by tyrants. Simple definition of a tyrant, a person with no truth bigger than their own little T and power over you. How many of the leaders of our day fit the simple definition of tyrants? George Orwell, a famous writer, said, the further a society risks from the truth, the more it hates those who speak it. In a time of universal deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. Truth is new hate speech. John Adams, American second president, said this, quote, our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. There are quotes like that from all the founders of our country. They founded a pluralist, they didn't want a state church, but all the founders of our country had one profound fear about our country. And that is that if people, if American people stopped going to church, the government would become their religion. That was their deepest fear. The recent Pew Research study shows that there's about 334 million people living in the United States today. Do you know how many out of that number go to any time of a church service on Sunday morning? 52 million. That's about 7%. If you have any doubt that the founders of our country's greatest fear is being realized before our eyes, Take yourself down to family court somewhere. Sit there for a couple of hours and listen to what people argue about in front of judges and lawyers that they used to bring to their clergy and their relatives. We are not going to be saved as a people, as a culture, in the realm of politics, even though we are in a political season in our country. Gilbert Keith Chesterton was a famous uh, British journalist and convert to the Catholic Church in England in 1922. He was a sometime political commentarian of his day, and in an article that was published in the Illustrated London News in April 1924, he said, among other things, the following. The whole world has divided itself politically between progressives and conservatives. So unlike our own day. <laughs> so the job of the progressives is to go on making mistakes. Job of the conservatives is to keep the mistakes from getting corrected. 1924. 
When Chesterton was asked for his own political orientation, he would always say, I'm an Orthodox Christian, meaning a faithful Christian, meaning a believing Christian. And he understood that civil service was important, but he said, if you make a religion out of secular politics, you create an idol that will destroy you. Our salvation is not going to be in that realm. He knew that first one. In 1925, he published his perhaps most famous book called The Everlasting Man. It was his thinking process of becoming a Roman Catholic. And it was a study of religion. He compared pagan religions to Christianity. And as he observed history, he noticed that every time a pagan religion became worldly in its orientation, decadent in its experience, they just died out. Worldliness destroyed them. Worldly spirit destroyed the pagan religion. Because there wasn't any substance beyond that natural religion. Christianity, he said, has done that, become worldly and decadent, five times in its long history. He said the history of the Catholic Church has been a major crisis every 500 years, starting with the Arian heresy in the first century. Major, a major crisis every 500 years. But the difference with Christianity, Chesterton noticed, was that it just wouldn't be done. He wouldn't be gracious enough and die. In fact, not only did it not die, it kept coming back. And when it came back, it was stronger, purified, less worldly. Not more worldly, less worldly, less decadent, more focused, purified. But that's happened five times. They're certainly going through the sixth major crisis right now. The reason he became a Catholic. And why that happened was the reason he became the Catholic. And it wasn't because we elected a new pope or called a council or a synod or issued a document. Some things, those things happen, but that's how we caused the reform. What he noticed was that the cause of reform each time was that God raised up men and women, living witnesses of holy virtue. And these great saints of our tradition led the church in those periods of crisis into a true and natural cause. That's what he noticed. The one that caught his attention the most was the founder of my religious order 900 years ago, St. Francis of Assisi, who rescued the church from the heresies and the schisms that were caused by undisciplined clergy at the height of Christendom because of this profound personal conversion, the, the holiness of his life, and the clarity of his teaching. Chesterton published a biography of St. Francis the year after he became a Catholic in 1923. Ten years later, the biography of St. Thomas Aquinas, our greatest historical mystic, our greatest historical theologian, and Chesterton said this, it is the paradox of history that every generation is converted by the saint that most contradicts it. He said this, we worship a God who knows how to rise from the dead. Other people have noticed this pattern, some of them might surprise you. Among them, Joseph Stalin, the infamous dictator of the Soviet Union. At the moment, there is a war going on, as we well know, between the Ukraine and Russia that has all kinds of explosive possibilities. But if you know history, you know some old pattern. Between 1932 and 1936, Joseph Stalin starved between four and six million Ukrainians to death. He is responsible for the death of over a hundred million people in the 20th century, most of them by starvation. Stalin had been a seminarian studying for the priesthood in the Russian Orthodox Church lost his faith in Christ, caused the death of more people in the 20th century than on a, on a single individual. On his deathbed, Stalin was shaking his fist at God. It is an irony of problems. His own daughter, her name was Svetlana Alimueva, died a devout practicing Roman Catholic and counter-distinction to her father's 
incomprehensible and insane hatred for God. But Joseph Stalin famously said, if I had 10 men like St. Francis of Assisi, I could have conquered the world. Stalin, as wicked as he was, even he saw it. Holiness was more powerful than wickedness, power, pride. He just made himself incapable of it. Holiness, the only attractive, it is the only effective reform. When Bernard Francis Casey, better known to the world now as our little Capuchin father, Solanus Casey died in the city of Detroit in 1957, there were 20,000 people at his funeral. I was at his beatification in the city of Detroit in November of 2017. It was at Ford Field, which is the football stadium of the Detroit Lions football team. That structure is built to seat 50,000 people. They had the altar and many of the faithful and the clergy on the field. They squeezed 80,000 people in the Ford Field for that mass. And Archbishop Vigoran said from the altar, he could have filled the stadium three times. They had to cut off registration for the mass. With all due respect to the Detroit Lions, <laughs> they've never filled that stadium. When Padre Pio died in Southern Italy in 1968, 100,000 people at his outdoor funeral events. I was at his canonization in Rome at St. Peter's Square with Pope John Paul, St. John Paul II in 2002. Half a million people poured out into the streets of Rome. I helped at San Giovanni Rotunda where Padre Pio lived for 50 years. There are six million visitors, pilgrims to that shrine. We are the largest number of people visiting the shrine of a Catholic saint in the world. It takes 20 priests to hear the confessions every day. A mystic once said to Padre Pio when he was alive that his spiritual advice would be responsible for a third of all the souls in heaven at the end of time, to which Padre Pio famously responded, just a third. <laughs> the saints are humble, right? It's the opposite virtue to pride. It's the healing virtue, the sin of pride. And they, because of their profound holiness, they draw us to him and they intercede for us on our behalf to him. They're great helpers and heroes. Now, today, we, you've been often colloquially used the phrase, he's a good person. No, she's a good person. God should just let them in to heaven. It's a good person. She's a good person. Let me tell you something. You don't get into heaven because you're good. Why? Simple. Because you can be good for unvirtuous reasons. If you live long enough, you realize people will give you jobs, money, pats on the back. If you're good, you learn to behave, right? You can save a marriage by just acting good. You can save your job by just being good, not being bad. Good, being good just keeps you out of jail. It doesn't get you to heaven. The saints are always good, but holiness is much more profound than being simply good. Right? Holiness, what does it mean? We use it in the mass. Christ holy. And it comes from the book of Revelation. Holy, holy, holy. It means not like the world. Not using worldly inspiration to guide my life, to guide my moral choices. Not looking to the world for guidance of my moral, ethical decision making. My actions are not formed by a worldly spirit. When you're standing on the deck of the Titanic and you're, it's about to go down and you're off of a lifeboat, you're not making a decision just to impress people. Right? You have to make a decision. If it's guided by the world, you get in the boat. Holiness is goes beyond that, even to sacrificing oneself. You know, there's a cause for Father Biles' canonization to be a saint in the Catholic Church. He was a convert. His father was a congregationalist minister. But in a heroic moment, he showed that he had a holy heart, a holy spirit. 
Pope St. John Paul II said this, just when night engulfs us, we must think about the dawn that is coming. We must believe that every morning the church is revived through the saints, not because they conquered the world, but because they allow Christ to conquer them. There is a thing going on in our culture today that is corrupting and leading many to many the people that we love and know through perdition. And tonight, I am hoping for some insight and inspiration to help on what this issue is going on in the culture. Been giving this talk uh, all over, uh, well, all over the world, but certainly all over our country. And I think it's been helpful to people. And I'll offer you some resources about it as well. At 6.30 tonight, the, the sermon is called The Greatest Threat to Holiness Today. On Monday night, a topic that I was asked to preach on by a number of people a few years ago, when I asked, what would you like to hear a Catholic priest prepare a sermon on? And hands down, is this one. How to raise faithful Catholics and how to encourage the return of those who left the practice of their Catholic faith. The sermon I've entitled on Monday night at 6.30, uh, pray, hope, and don't work. And finally, on Tuesday, uh, before I leave you, uh, we'll have mass on the closed mission, and the topics there is drawn from a true experience that uh, Mike Warder had when we were asked to go to the South Pacific Island of New Guinea by Pope Pius XII in 1955, and there encountered a pre-Christian pagan culture that was intensely violent tribal fighting. Polygamous marriages for young girls were sold off into marriages with men they didn't know. They were property sold to them uh, into polygamous marriages, and they were cannibals. You heard me right. And I'm going to tell you the true story of what converted Melanesian islands at the beginning to the Catholic faith. And it says, miraculous, as it is simple. And I'm convinced it's the key that is going to reconvert our own culture. A sermon entitled, The Most Holy Eucharist and the True Meaning.